All right, so welcome to a brief history of Western ideas. This is an idea first way of looking at the history of Western civilization in terms of the core ideas that influenced each of its ages. And if you want this, so this is going to be very oversimplified because we're just looking at the broad brushstrokes of Western civilization. If you want more details into this, check out my five part lecture series from the class the rise and fall of Christian civilization, which gets into all of this at a much deeper level. But for now, just an overview, just the broad brushstrokes. So the first thing we want to do when looking at Western civilization is break it down into its three basic ages. And each age, ancient, medieval, and modern, is characterized by a particular adherence to a certain worldview or core philosophy, the core idea that influences everything else that's going on in that period. So the ancient world, now the ancient world kind of goes back a ways to the, to the Iron Age and the Bronze Age and all that kind of stuff, but these core ideas are mostly the same. So we're just going to mostly focus on uh, classical antiquity, as it's called. But generally speaking, let's, go, let's say this is about 600 uh, to, we put this at 500 AD. It's about a thousand years here, and then here, roughly 1500 AD, and then we're here at 2000 plus going that way. So we're looking at about 500 year chunks to a thousand year chunks. So each of the major periods is defined by a core worldview, like I said. So for the ancient world, it's paganism. And that's a, that's a big umbrella term for a lot of different phenomena. We'll talk about that in a second. The medieval world is characterized primarily by Christianity as its core worldview. And then the modern period by what we're going to call secularism. Big brushstrokes. So what's going on in the pagan worldview? couple things that I want to highlight. One is this idea of cosmic hierarchy. So what that means is that the whole ancient world is part of, part of, part of a cosmic hierarchy, not just a social hierarchy. Because there's a social hierarchy in paganism too. There's the ruling elites, there's merchant class, there's sort of the, the farmers, and, and then there's the slave class, and there's, there's, there's a normal stratification in pagan society, but for them it's fully integrated in with a cosmic hierarchy too, because of course above the rulers of say Greece or Rome are the demigods, and then the lesser gods, and then the higher gods, and, and it's all interwoven cosmically with religious and political being inseparable categories for them. We today talk about the distinction between church and state, and we have those kind of categories. We'll get to that later. But for, for the pagans in the ancient world, there was no separation. Everything was fully integrated. So if you were being pious and sacrificing to the gods, this was also a political and cultural function that you would do, it, inseparable as a religious function. So everything was part of this cosmic hierarchy, and that kind of meant in a sort of ultimate sense, that the human beings, no matter how powerful they were, were slaves to the gods and to that sort of cosmic setup. What does that mean? This gets, this gets to the second thing here, which is that on the pagan worldview, because everything is structured, right? You have to understand that for this cosmic perspective of looking at the world, you, sitting right there, are just part of one part of the whole. You're just a little piece, a little microcosm in the macrocosm of existence. And so individual people don't matter so much. Uh, in fact, it's quite dramatic compared to our world now. So for the pagans, you would say something like nature, uh, or you might say fate, uh, is greater than the person. In f it's so much so that the person as a category doesn't really exist for the pagans in the same way that it exists for us now. Person means persona, it's a Latin word, it means mask. 
It's the face that you have before the law or before your fellow citizens or things like that. And not everyone had a face in this way before the law. Slaves didn't, for example. Non-citizens didn't. Condemned men and criminals didn't. So this idea that everyone has some kind of intrinsic, unique human value that we have now, this idea of human rights and all this kind of stuff, it wouldn't have even been comprehensible to our pagan ancestors. They would not have understood what you were talking about, right? So, and, and, and this makes sense because for them, nature, fate, in other words, the big picture of the cosmos was supreme. And why wouldn't it be? That's kind of a natural position to, to be in. You go outside, you look at the world, the universe is giant, uh, nature and seasons are always shifting and moving without your consent. Could be a good year for crops, could be a bad year for crops. The gods could get pissed and blow up your ships or send a typhoon or something like that. And then, of course, everybody dies, right? So there's no, there's no sense, there, there would be no reason to think anything except that nature and your ultimate fate and your integration into the cosmos is greater than, than you. Uh, and, and so much so that the you may or may not even exist. And it certainly didn't have, a, there was no robust concept of the person for the ancient pagans. So, how did this, this worldview change in, and shift into another era? Well, a man came back from the dead, right? That's the claim. So, when Jesus comes back from the dead, it is a, it's kind of a big deal. It's not just like, that's weird, that doesn't happen normally. It's like, yeah, no duh doesn't happen normally, but it fundamentally calls this whole paradigm into question, right? So, for Christianity, there's two, two major things here, which is the resurrection of Christ. So a man came back from the dead. Well, that inverts this pattern completely, right? That means the person is greater than nature. Because if, you, if everybody dies, well, then that's your nature. And then nature is better than you no matter what you do about it. And all these quests for immortality are doomed to fail because everyone is doomed to die. That's what fate means, by the way. Doom and fate are synonyms in an older sense of the words. But when a man comes back from the dead, then the person is greater than nature. That's a huge, huge deal. It transforms everything about the way that ancient people started to see the world. And they started to see the world in terms of having hope, like a real ultimate hope, that not everything was doomed to die. If, if a person could overcome nature, and then of course Christ doesn't just say, because I'm awesome and you're not, he says, and you can all do this too. That's the promise of Christianity. And that was very appealing to the ancient pagans because their whole world was basically a slavery to the gods and a submission to nature and death. And so by the end of the late antique kind of pagan world, you have all this sort of cosmic ennui and depression. And so many of, of the cults and, and religious impulses and political movements were characterized by this ennui and this longing to escape uh, the whole, the horrible kind of world that you're stuck in and faded into, but they had no way of breaking out of it until Christianity came along and offered this radical cosmic hope for everyone in the world. And this is related to the second thing too, which is that a uh, person became an absolute category. And what I want to say, I want to say that's this thing here, radical human dignity, which, which did not exist, as we said, on this paradigm. Why did this happen? Well, this is because of the incarnation. So you, you have to understand what this means in the context of Christian theology. Christ, the, the ancient Christians didn't present Christ as some kind of guy who got so good that he became a god. That was very common in this paradigm, in the old pagan paradigm. But for Christianity, the idea is that God himself, the transcendent God of all being, came down and became a man, took on human nature, and was both God and man together. And what this means is another radical paradigm shift, which is that it's not just that the person is the face you, the persona, right, is not just the face you wear, before the law or before other kind of social relations and is ultimately subordinate to your nature. You have a nature, but then you sort of put on these different personae because of your different relationships. 
No, no. Now the person is an absolute category because at the height of all creation, the Christian claim is, there is not one person but three persons, the Trinity, all working together in perfect unity, a community of persons. That's how God is love, by the way. We'll get into that later. And that radically dignifies the human person for everybody, for, for men and women, Greeks and Jews, slave and free. This is what Paul says in his epistle. Everyone has this nature now, this, this image of God. That's what that means, to all be in Christ. It means now the person, just by being a human being, ha- is endowed with a radical, inalienable human dignity, to sort of use the language of the Founding Fathers. And that's a huge shift, these two things. And they start, you know, that shift happens, of course, around 30, 40, 50 A.D. And it takes a few centuries to, to ferment. And then by 500-ish, these are historical generalizations, we have entered into a, a whole new era of, of interacting with the world, of, of Western civilization. In brief... And check out my other lecture again if you want more details on this, because there are a lot more details. In brief, these two ideas root out all the old pagan ideas, and they bring this radical human dignity to the fore, and this demystified nature, persons greater than nature, and we're not slaves to the gods anymore. And this drives all kinds of technological, social, political, philosophical innovation into the medieval era. And the medieval, the medieval era is characterized by these innovations. It's characterized by a massive growth in technology uh, and, and in learning and thinking. There, the, the whole idea of the Dark Ages, this period, is, is a total myth. It's, it's historical revisionism. Renaissance humanists did this. It's another story. But massive technological innovation happened in the Christian medieval world, partly because they no longer saw slavery uh, as something very good, right? And that's another, that's another whole, whole conversation. But if everyone has radical human dignity, you no longer have to have slaves in the same way, or it's no longer permissible, right, to have, to have that kind of slavery. I'll give you an example of this. Did you know that the Greeks invented the steam engine? It's true. It's true. But, well, you don't, you don't have all this, like, weird steampunk Athens or something. That didn't happen in history. They invented it, and they thought, oh, that's interesting, and then they got rid of it. Or they didn't, they didn't advance on that technology. Why? Because they had no interest in it. Because, at least to use Athens as the example, they had an entire class in society of slaves, a whole cast of slaves, basically, who did all the manual labor. So for the intellectual sort of aristocratic, they weren't aristocrats, but the the wealthy Athenians who had the time to sit around and invent stuff and think about things because they didn't have to do manual labor, for them, the idea of improving technology for labor saving, that didn't really, that wasn't an interest. That wasn't sort of on their radar, as it were, because why would they need it? They have a whole cast of society devoted to doing all the manual labor, so it just didn't occur to them. But when you when you change the idea, the fundamental idea that all humans are endowed with radical human dignity, then all of a sudden, you know, you, we're not going to just rely on a whole slave society. People all have dignity. Everybody's working, and then there's an interest in labor saving. This is very overgeneralized, but but it's to the point enough, right? There's a lot of nuance to that to that historical evolution. But it's still fundamentally rooted in these ideas. So tremendous technological innovation, tremendous logical and scientific innovation, actually, because on this worldview, on paganism, the, the, the world is peopled with all these mysterious powers, the gods and demigods and muses and spirits. And so to interact with them is sort of fundamentally dangerous because you, that's the domain of the gods, and you don't, maybe you don't want to mess with that. You might get zapped. But if Christ is the conqueror of all the old gods, if he defeats and drives out the demons, the elemental powers of the world, that's the language Paul uses, then, then suddenly nature can be investigated. It can be entered into. Uh, and the idea is that nature is the rational, nature is the product of a rational creator, one single rational creator. So that means, ergo, there's a rationale to nature rather than, say, the arbitrary kind of cosmology of all these pagan gods at war with each other. It's not necessarily rational in the same way. It's not necessarily orderly. It's sort of chaotic, right? If you've read the Odyssey or the Iliad, where all the gods are picking fights with each other and then moving the humans around like chessmen you know, to sort of work out their pet- petty rivalries, 
that's not a world that, that's for man to go and investigate in. That's a world where man wants to keep his head down and give the right propitiations to keep the gods off his back. So what's the point of all of that? Well, it drives scientific innovation and logical innovation and learning and all this kind of stuff. And we know this, the most paradigmatic example of this, is the creation of the university system. So the university is actually the unique invention of a Christian medieval culture. The university is not a modern invention, it's a medieval invention. And the university, people all coming together, exchanging ideas, debating, arguing, doing experiments, is what drives all the innovation for the period and lays the groundwork for the Renaissance, which happens around here, early modernity. So 1300 to maybe 15 something, you know, that's vaguely around when the different sort of Renaissance happen. And they happen because of all this innovation and technology and learning, primarily centered around the universities emerging in Europe at the time. So that's what drives all of that. And that's the, the Renaissance is sort of the crown and ultimate culmination of the medieval period in a certain sense. A lot of people think of it as the beginning of modernity. Really, it's the, the crown of the medieval era. Okay, so what begins modernity? Well, what starts modernity, what transitions to this to this whole new paradigm is the Reformation. Let's put that up here. So the Reformation is starts with Martin Luther, who you may have heard of, and it kind of kicks off the modern era. And what it is is just very simply, there was a Catholic monk who was dissatisfied with what, some things that were going on in the Catholic Church. He protested, he made a big stink about it, and he wanted to institute some reforms in the Western Church but it ended up kind of exploding into this giant sort of proliferation of denominations all over Europe. So it led to all kinds of new breaks between different churches and different denominations. And then there was all this fighting and all these wars. And, and what emerged from that was actually a fractured, a fractured Europe. So there's a lot of factors to this. And I need, we need to oversimplify this again. But... The Reformation, really, really basic. The Reformation results in no religious unity in Europe. Because in this period, while there are many nations and many cultures and all this kind of stuff, everyone was united by a shared kind of common religious framework, an ultimate worldview that everybody shared. And that was instituted within the social and political life of Europe. With the Reformation, there's a break from that. Now there's Catholics here and Lutherans and Calvinists and Zwinglians and all these different people. And so the, the cultural, spiritual, and intellectual unity of Europe starts disintegrating. And this is very convenient for certain people. Who might those people be? Well, there were many princes and local ruling powers who resented the influence of, just simply speaking, the, the Catholic Church in politics, or the, the whole idea of a united single empire, one empire, one church, that people didn't like that, certain princes, because they wanted to rule themselves, and they didn't want, they didn't want to have anything, let's, let's say, the nation state, the emerging nation state, which is a new form of government for the modern era, is characterized by not wanting to be beholden to any institutions at all, to the empire, to some unified culture of Europe, to the moral authority of any particular church. And so everything that we see the Reformation gets in the Reformation gets co-opted uh, into this project of the emerging nation state. So now the nation state is complicated and there's a lot of factors to it. But the most important feature, I think, for this conversation is that the nation state is sort of what you would call the rise of um, what you would call the rise of state absolutism. Meaning that it's the concept of a state that has no other checks on it at all. Moral, political, cultural, etc. So the interest of the nation state is in taking religion, not not because in the medieval world, religion and church and state checked and balanced each other. One wasn't higher than the other. They were they were on the same plane and they often corrected each other and all this kind of stuff. The paradigm for the nation state for rising secularism is that the the religious 
and moral authority, everything has to be subject to the state. The state is absolute, and it can't, have, it can't suffer any other rivals to its claims to power. And part of the reason that this transition was able to happen is because all the Reformation stuff, everyone was fighting and arguing, and, and there were a lot of blood spilled uh, in the modern era over the so-called wars of religion. And so the excuse was kind of, well, look, we can't all agree on religion. That's a problem not like we could in this period. And so we need something neutral. We need something that's beyond religion that we can all come together and agree on. That's what secularism means. Just just the sort of neutral, ah-religious, let's say, uh, way of looking at the world. That's a big shift. Because for this worldview, religion, like I said, has a place at the table in, ter in terms of the question, how do we run our society? That's an important question. And you want to bring your worldview into the question, how do you run society? Well, what's the nature of the world? Then you bring in worldview, i.e. religion. Here, all those religious answers have to get pushed out. They get pushed out because nobody can agree on religion. That's the excuse. And so the state ends up being the thing that takes all of the power into itself to, to kind of like here, your persona is only verified through your existence in relation to the state, like the state grants you your personhood, and the state grants moral authority and moral agency to people. Let's see. So the church really becomes the extension of the nation state, or it's pushed into the private sphere. Uh, this happened in France with the, with the Catholic Church. France doesn't need Protestantism because the French crown had already subjected, subjugated the Catholic Church at, to an extension of the crown. The crown appointed bishops, for example. That's a big deal. So, so if the church just does whatever the state says and it's an extension of the state, then the state has achieved its absolutism, right? And then morality also becomes an extension of state power or the consensus of the people, which is ultimately verified through state power or, or reified through state power. So. You have this problem, which is the, the uh, attempts at, let's call it attempts at a secular morality. What does this mean? Well, everybody is still living off the fumes of the moral, um, the moral structure, let's say, of the Christian world, which is what created this, this modern world. Everyone's still living off this sort of assumed set of values, values like intrinsic human dignity and personhood and all this kind of stuff, freedom from fate and so forth. Things that would have been impossible for the pagans, corrected by Christianity, and then modernity assumes all of those values, but it becomes uncomfortable with the theology surrounding it because the state doesn't want anything to do with uh, any power bigger than itself. So there's all these attempts to sort of create a moral system anchored in something that isn't religion. This is what the Enlightenment project is. So the Enlightenment, which is sort of 17, 1800s, is this attempt to take Christian values but divorce them from theology. You still want the good Christian values, but you need to get rid of all the theology involved uh, because that's, that's a contentious thing that people disagree about. And it's a, it's a threat to the power of the state. So they came up with all these different kind of rationalistic bases for morality. The most famous is probably utilitarianism, uh, which is the idea that you should do the most good for the most number of people and reduce suffering as much as possible uh, because, because, right? There's no real grounding for it. It's supposed to be a rationalist ethics and it's an attempt to replace Christianity. But when you just have a rationalist ethics, let me write that down rationalist when you just have a rationalist ethics it sounds good at first but then there are problems and the problems are kind of manifest fully and most brazenly in the 20th century because of course the 20th century is the rise of all of these different nation states and all these different alternatives to the medieval way of running the world communism and fascism and statism and the liberal democracy and, and all these kinds of things that 
that all come into conflict with each other, first in World War I, and then in World War II, and then in the Cold War. And so just the, the brutality of the 20th century, the sheer number of people who died, the number of civilians who were, who were murdered, and, and all this stuff starts to reveal that the main power that runs and influences the modern world is the secular nation state. And rationality, although attempted to be used to create a pure rational ethics that everybody can agree on regardless of religion, in fact turns out to just be in the service of power, namely the power of the absolute state. And so all the scientific advancements here in, in the medieval world are about making human life better. And plenty of the advancements in the modern world are about that too, but plenty of them are also about destroying human life. Uh, the, you know, the over, if you've ever read anything about the, the concentration camps, you know, the experiments and Nazi science that they, they, they performed on all their prisoners and, and things, it was incredibly scientific, incredibly rationalistic. And, and we actually learned a lot uh, about the human body and about health and disease and all kinds of stuff from all the horrible experiments that some of these people did. So that's kind of sad. And technology was driven incredibly by the needs of the world wars, culminating, of course, in the atom bomb, in which we, you know, the United States nuked Japan, basically. They, and, and the extravagant brutality of the 20th century is not explainable purely by advances in technology. Well, now we have an atom bomb, so of course more people are going to die in this period than in any other period in human history. It's not just because of technological advancements. That's, that's putting the, heart before, the cart before the horse. It's because of the needs of the nation state and to have no other rivals, even among other nation states. So scientific progress wouldn't have gone in that direction in the first place at all on, on this kind of conception of the world. That's not to say there weren't wars and corruption and, and problems. You know, every age has humans in it, so every, every age is going to be disappointing in some, some very real degree. But, but I'm, what I'm trying to say is that the driving power of the nation state is what drove all these advancements, uh, specifically for warfare, for tear gas, for tanks, for napalm, for the atom bomb, for all of these like means of destruction and, and the gulags and the concentration camps, all these instruments of horror and torture is why the modern period is so full of and characterized by horrors uh, is because of this advancing in technology. Okay, so then what happens? What happens? Well, then you get the postmodern uh, reaction to, to the modern nation state and to the, to the whole modern project as a whole. What is this reaction? Very briefly, let's say Christianity had this kind of this religious answer to the problem of human existence. And it put to death all the old superstitions about paganism and, and slavery to the gods and all the stuff, and it replaced them with a theological-based way of looking at the world. Modernity displaces Christianity with a, an attempted rationalist way of looking at the world. Oh, we don't need all that stuff. We just need pure reason. Well, when pure reason ends up failing to ground morality in any coherent worldview that, that guarantees human dignity for people the way having the God of the universe also be a man can do, which nothing else can really do that, fails to create a rationalist ethics, and then instead uses rationality to drive all of these, these prodigious horrors of modern warfare and, and the crimes of the, of the modern nation states, then there's a reaction against reason, too. Well, you see how reason failed us. You know, all these rationalist promises of the Enlightenment all ended in in war and destruction. That's why Europe becomes so nihilistic following the wars, because the world wars, because their whole world is devastated and, and destroyed. And the thing that promised them freedom and reason and peace and prosperity, technology will lead to some kind of utopia, all went down in flames. And so there's a, there's a real understandable disillusionment about this whole rationalist enlightenment project. And the problem with that is then you have this postmodern milieu, kind of starts in 1950 and on, where people don't even trust reason. So no religion, no reason, no faith in science, no faith in anything, 
Now what do you have left? Well, unfortunately, all you have left is power. When you take away reason, when you take away dialogue, when you take away faith and theology and worldview, your worldview just becomes one about power, which is kind of what I've been saying all this is about anyway. So the issue now is we still are stuck with a secular age. We're still in this milieu where the nation state has this kind of sense of state absolutism and subjugates all other areas of life to itself. We have an increasing totalitarianism sort of in every, in every way of governing that we see around the world. Some places it's a small increase, other places it's large. And then when you try to talk to people about stuff, we find that as a whole, our culture is disillusioned both with religion and with reason. And all that's left is a belief in power. So it's about getting power, keeping other people from having power, and stopping the people that you don't like. And that, that led to a really brutal 20th century. It may lead to a very brutal 21st century. We're going to have to see. So where we go from here is not clear, but this should frame it for you why we are, why we are in this situation in modernity. It's because of the change that happened in the ancient and, and the medieval world. And then where we go from here and how we navigate this conversation is about figuring out what, what needs to happen to guarantee our basic rights and freedoms and, and perhaps restore our belief in reason or theology or any worldview beyond a worldview centered totally on power. And I just want to end with, I think I want to end with um, Nietzsche. So Nietzsche was a 1800s philosopher, a German philosopher, who was very worried about this change from medieval to modern. Now, he was no friend of Christianity. He hated Christianity, actually, for a lot of reasons. But he wasn't a fool. He knew that he correctly recognized that all of Western civilization, in some very real sense, was founded on the fundamental values of Christianity and Christian culture. And so if we remove that, it's like playing Jenga. You remove that big piece of wood at the bottom, which is Christian culture and values. The whole thing is going to tumble down because there is no, in a real sense, there's no Western civilization without the ideas of medieval Christianity. So Nietzsche went, okay, we're trying to remove this thing, but everyone who thinks that nothing is going to change is totally naive. Everybody who thinks that we can just have a purely rationalist ethics uh, divorce from any theology or anything like that doesn't understand the conversation, the whole conversation. So he was really worried that in the absence of any transcendent values that humanity would evolve, devolve into a race of, of bugmen, of the, a race of insects uh, who could produce no great art, no great deeds, totally enslaved to mediocrity and and basic pleasures and addictions, uh, like a like a race of ants. You know, we can't we can't do anything, and and it's because we can't believe in anything. That would be his point. So he was very worried about all of this, and a lot of what he predicted came true, and we're still in the middle of it. So uh, to be continued. That's the story of Western Civ. I'm going to be doing a part two of the history of Western ideas that just focuses on the transition from medieval to modern and modernity in detail because it's a very complex conversation that happens from the Renaissance through the Enlightenment into, the, into modernity and late modernity and postmodernism and all this kind of stuff. So we'll do that justice in a later lecture. But for now, here is your general overview. And now you know a little bit about the history of Western ideas.